Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar entitled Rolling Out the Welcome Mat, Rethinking Pet-Related Restrictions. It is being presented by the National Apartment Association's Operations Committee. My name is James Campbell, and I'm the Senior Manager of Industry Relations with NAA. I want to welcome all of our members in attendance. Thank you for joining us for this important topic. Before we get started, I wanted to go over a few housekeeping points. First, this presentation is being recorded and will be posted to our website and YouTube channel next week. You may then share this presentation with those colleagues and friends who are unable to attend at present. Second, we have a lot of time at the end for live questions and answers. You may type your questions into the Q&A or chat boxes on your screen, and we will share them with our presenters. Now, I am very pleased to introduce our moderator, John Bradford, who, who will in turn introduce our speakers. John is an experienced entrepreneur and CEO with a history of working in the property management and pet tech industry, as well as in local and state government. He is the founder of Pet Screening and Park Avenue Properties. John is also serving a third term in the North Carolina House of Representatives. John? James, thank you. NAA, thank you for uh, hosting today's webinar. I know we have, I think, over 500, almost 600 people registered. So thank you for everyone that's taking time out of their day. And we have a, an amazing all-star lineup here, and I would not do justice to introduce them. So I'm going to let each one uh, introduce. We're going to start with Wendy Dorchester, who's a Senior Vice President of Operations at Pegasus Residential. Wendy, please take a moment and uh, introduce yourself. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so excited about today's attendance, and it's like popcorn. It's like popping. There's people that are jumping on, so uh, the numbers are rising as we speak. I'm Wendy Dorchester, Senior Vice President of Operations and Culture at Pegasus Residential. I've been in the industry for, believe it or not, it's my 30th year, which I can't believe. I feel like I've only been in for 10 years, but uh, it's been a while. I oversee a portfolio of communities in, I, I'm, I've lost count because I'm getting ready to take over 17 properties next week. So, um, but right now in Louisiana, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia, soon to be Ohio, uh, uh, Michigan, Tennessee, um, I'm probably missing a few, but I'm really grateful to be here and I can't wait to, uh, to, to engage in conversation uh, today with this panel. So thank you for having me. You bet. And Judy, I'm sure many of you know of Judy. So Judy, tell us a little more about yourself. Thank you, John. Also really happy to be here. I'm Judy Bellack, and I'm the industry principal for Michelson Found Animals Foundation. They are the entity that focuses on the Pet Inclusive Housing Initiative, which hopefully many of you have heard of by now. Um, but as John said, I've been around in the industry for a while. I have my own consulting business, which is Judith Lawrence Associates. And have a long career in the industry like Wendy, about 30 years, working for companies like Apartment Guide in the really early days when they were still just a book. So I just totally dated myself um, all the way up um, through with RentPath, um, helping steer that whole digital uh, print to digital conversion. So excited to be here, excited to talk with you guys about this topic in particular. Thank you, Judy. And last but not least, we have David, who I've enjoyed getting to know. That's one thing about this industry. We get to meet people and doing things like this. And David's a ball of energy. So David, take a moment, introduce yourself to the uh, folks who are listening. Thank you, John. And it's absolutely fabulous to uh, be here today, particularly with this uh, subject. Uh, I've been in uh, multifamily and uh, retail management for over 30 years. Uh, I'm very active in our local trade associations and on the national uh, trade association through IRAM. Um, I founded my firm Oculus in uh, 2010. We are primarily uh, urban uh, boutique property uh, owners, developers, and managers. Um, over the last several years, we've moved out of third-party management, and we mostly do uh, investment for our own book, uh, advisory work for developers, and uh, expert witness work in the uh, uh, standard of care in property management. I am actually relatively new to pet ownership over the last six or seven years, um, but have absolutely fallen in love. And this has become a topic very near and dear to me and, uh, and my communities. Thank you very much. So we're gonna dive into the deck here. Uh, again, welcome. We're going to uh, keep this lighthearted. Uh, if you have questions, remember in the uh, uh, tool here, you have a Q&A section. You're welcome to put questions there. So you can do that anytime. We'll get to them at the end. So let's, uh, I'm going to kick us off with some data. 
Um, everyone on this call has a pet, at least in terms of the panelists. Uh, and if I had a chance to see all of you, I bet you if I said, do you have a pet or even maybe grew up with a pet, a majority of you would raise your hands. The reality is um, here in the United States, we love our fur babies and 67% of households have a pet and at pet screening, we have a lot of data. So we've able to measure, it's not just one pet, it's actually 1.6 pets per household. So it's, it's really more than just one per. So there's a lot of animals out there, which is exciting. And 46% of those are owned by, you know, Gen Z and millennials. And, you know, Gen Z, just as a reminder, in all fairness, I, I thought I knew what it was, but it's from 1997 to 2012. So if you were born in that, you're a Gen Zer. Uh, and millennials are 1981 to 1996. So that span of individuals, they have 46% of the pet ownership, which is really amazing. It's a big business. Um, you know, every time I, I go into a store like Costco, I always tend to buy either a dog treat or a pack of four toys. Uh, it's just we spend money uh, on our fur babies because they're like our children. It's truly a, over a hundred billion dollar industry just alone in 2021 and will continue to climb. And one interesting thing, which I, you know, I'm proud to say that Pet Screening helped lead along with Jay Turner Research, we screened or, or requested a survey of about 30,000 multifamily residents. And we did this with a couple of large companies who wanted to know this about their own properties. And 23,000 of those 30,000 actually responded. So it's a very good data set. And it was an anonymous survey. So I think people felt comfortable sharing information with us. And one thing that we learned was that 26% of residents who are living in multifamily said they went and got another pet during the pandemic. And so I think that's a wonderful, I think unintended consequence of COVID is that these you know, animals that were in shelters and rescues now have a home, but it also presents a new challenge because now uh, multifamily operators across the country may not know where all these pets are. So that's its own thing. So, um, and all these, you can see some of the sources at the bottom, American Pet Product Association, Statista, of course, Pet Screening and J. Turner Research are where these facts are come from. Just wanna share that with you. So I wanna go into a little bit with Judy, we're gonna start with you, if you don't mind. And we really, you know, you're, I consider you to be an expert in this, especially with your role with uh, Mickelson Found uh, Animal Organization. The history of pets and multifamily, you know, really speak to, if you don't mind, you know, just sort of the lore around breeds, how the breed restrictions started and really where the needs are today. So I'm just going to let you run with it for a few minutes. Sure. Thank you. And yeah, I, I wouldn't quite call myself an expert yet, but let's say I'm becoming one, right? A lot to learn. And there's really an interesting, interesting history within our industry with regard to pets, certainly within my career not too far back, relatively speaking, not a lot of apartment communities allowed pets. Certainly today, that is not the case. But when we look at the history of breed restrictions, which most apartment communities have breed and size restrictions these days, that all sort of started decades ago with the CDC, which put out what they called a dangerous breed list. And the CDC has since completely reversed themselves on that and, and acknowledged that that data set was really, really flawed because it only reported certain types of dog bites. In fact, not only have they reversed themselves, they've come out to say that they really don't believe there are such things as dangerous breeds, certainly dangerous individual dogs and certainly irresponsible pet owners, but not dangerous breeds. Um, not only does the CDC hold that position, the Humane Society of the US holds, holds that position as well as the ASPCA and surprisingly the American Bar Association. So, um, you know, really those are entities that are experts in um, animal welfare and they do not believe in, that breed restrictions are the way to go. Um, so, you know, what we look at is that we have some opportunities to lessen and even eliminate restrictions in our industry, and we are already seeing companies do that, and you know, we'll hear more about that today from Wendy and David, which I'm really excited about. But I also have some really great data to bring to you. One data point is actually from the study that John referenced earlier that was done by Jay Turner Research and Pet Screening, and it is that 24% of residents act, um, of residents um, do not actively support breed restrictions, and only 20% report. I'm sorry, uh, support weight restrictions. So even your own residents aren't really behind this and would like to see things open up a little bit. Um, another point of reference to look at is. 
that if you look at the American Kennel Club's top 10 breeds in the United States, six of those 10 breeds would be completely eliminated at most apartment communities from living there due to either their size or their um, breed. And that includes dogs like golden retrievers, Labradors, poodles. So, you know, it really speaks to the fact that the industry really narrows their rental pool by, you know, holding on to breed and weight restrictions. Um, some more data that I have to, for you actually comes from the Pet Inclusive Housing Report survey that was done in 2020, which speaks to um, the next point, which is that residents do have trouble finding pet friendly housing. There's a real disconnect here. So for example, 78% of apartment owner operators or rental housing operators believe that they are pet friendly and would categorize themselves as pet friendly. However, 72% of renters say that pet friendly housing is really hard to find. And of course, that relates back to the breed and weight restrictions that are in place. So I think there is a lot that we can do in the industry to lessen that disconnect and make our communities um, more embracing of all kinds of pets. You know, one of the barriers that we often hear when we talk to, or a couple of the barriers when we talk to rental housing operators in the space are first concerns about damages. And our study shows that only 9% of rental units report any kind of damage whatsoever from pets. And the average pet damages within that is only about $210. So most pet deposits more than cover those damages. So a big misconception there. The other big mis misconception is around insurance. We hear from a lot of the operators that we talk to that they're really concerned about their insurance and um, you know, their liability and opening up uh, you know, and eliminating restrictions could drive their insurance costs up. And it's interesting because it does seem to be a misconception. Many of the operators we've talked to, once they actually have checked with their insurance companies, have found that there is no additional cost to doing that. There are still some insurance companies who have breed restrictions in place, but we're seeing this less and less. And the bottom line is that there really is not data to support that there is you know, such a thing as a dangerous breed. Certain breeds have simply gotten bad raps over the years for a variety of reasons. Business benefits. So, you know, we've looked into this with our own research, talking to operators and doing case studies. And what we have found is that there are really some enormous business benefits to embracing pets in a more inclusive manner. Um, our study shows that the average pet owner stays in a rental housing unit 21% longer um, than a non-pet owner. That obviously translates to lower turn costs, less vacancy loss. We have a great example from one of our case studies with the management group out of Atlanta. Many of you may know Jamin Harkness, one of their um, partners. They lifted breed restrictions about three years ago. And in the ensuing years, they've seen about an 80% renewal rate among their pet owners, which is just extraordinary, as you guys all know. You know, even, even through the pandemic, um, uh, with the bounce up in renewal rate, that only reached about 60%. It's very quickly fallen now that things are opening up again. And so to achieve 80% renewal rate with your pet owning population is just enormous, uh, just all kinds of financial benefit there. And, you know, one of the other huge benefits is that it does create more connected communities. You know, pet owners get to know each other. They do things with their dogs. They go to your pet runs. They share happy hours, um, you know, as they're letting their dogs play. Um, but one of the other benefits is that uh, you all have seen the huge spike in fraudulent ESA claims. And when you open up your policies, which sometimes do unfortunately tend to drive those claims, you see less of that. Now, I don't have data on that, but John, I know you do. So I'm going to bounce it back to you. Well, th thank you. Well, there's definitely a correlation between um, you know, breed restrictions on site and then the number of animals that those same properties have. So the top five breeds for assi assistance animals like ESAs, 
It's pit bulls mixed breed because mixed could be a combination of 99% pit bull, 1% something else. It's German shepherds, it's Labrador retrievers, and it's chihuahuas. The point is three of that five list a top five are typically breeds that are restricted. So if you were to open your policies and be more opening to all pets, more inclusive, then those individuals would not feel forced to go see a therapist or a counselor and try to you know, say, hey, this is a, I need an accommodation for this assistance animal, because after all, you can't charge for assistance animals. So not only do you forego any pet fees that you may have been able to collect had you just allowed them to begin with, but the reality is all dogs bite. I mean, we hear maintenance people complaining that chihuahuas bite them more than anything. And granted, a chihuahua is not going to kill you. I understand that. But the point is, all dogs will bite. And at pet screening, I mean, we've screened over 200,000 reasonable accommodation requests for people seeking either a service animal or an ESA or support animal. And we found that only 40% of them meet the standard. So 120,000 of those 200,000 are not assistance animals, but properties are still letting them on site. So you're really losing on one end and then you're losing again because you're not properly reviewing them. So pet screening, of course, is here to help and the data really speaks for itself. So inclusivity is something to be considered. Judy, that was amazing information. Thank you for sharing that and uh, the work that your organization is doing to, I would say, open eyes and change hearts is amazing. Um, it really is. And there's this new initiative called ESG. I say it's new, but we're hearing more about it. Environmental social governance. We are now seeing yesterday I was on a call with a big firm, a big management firm. I won't name who they are, but they're really looking at pet inclusives, uh, pet inclusivity as a part of their ESG initiative, which I think is amazing. So anyway, now let's get to what I'd like to call some of the meat of today's uh, topic, because we have some uh, an operator, developer, operators together, Wendy and David. I want to hear from you guys, uh, specifically from the front lines. And Wendy, we're going to start with you. Let me see if I can advance this slide. Give me one second. Um, here we go. Thank you so much. So, uh, so Pegasus, take us through some of the things you guys are doing. You're a real leader, in my opinion, in the industry. And thank you for your thought leadership, by the way. So share some of the things you're doing with the good work there at Pegasus. Thank you so much, John. Um, you know, I'm so proud to work for a company that absolutely loves pets. I'm in the corporate office today here in Atlanta. I've been here for a few days and I walk around the office and there are crates next to people's desks. There are baby gates up at people's cubicles and some of the accounting areas. So many of our associates bring their pets to work and I just love being around that. It just brings me a lot of joy. Um, Pegasus is a relatively young company founded in 2009 and our CEO, uh, Lindy Ware and the entire organization absolutely loves pets. Um, we've been, you know, very into rescue at our organization. So the majority of the pets that I know about inside of Pegasus are all rescued, including our mascot Mia, who has been rescued from you know being being left behind at an apartment community. Imagine that. So we we have a lot of people that are very into rescue, and we've given a lot over the years through organizations such as the ASPCA. Just a couple of years ago, we raised over forty thousand dollars in one year as our yearly philanthropy here. Um, we usually choose a philanthropy philanthropy. We've also done Angels Among Us and a few of the other philanthropies as well. So pets mean a lot to us. What we decided here at Pegasus, and you know, I happen to be a Great Dane owner. So I have two Great Danes. I have a Shiba Inu mix. I also have a naked Sphinx kitty cat, and I have a Siamese kitty. And what I found over the years is that the, the smaller animals and sometimes um, there's, there, they, they do is just as much damage as the large ones. And so really it's about making sure that we have great pet owners that want to make sure that they take care of the property. It's not about the breed or the size. In fact, if you look into what a Great Dane is all about, Great Danes are fantastic apartment dogs. They love to just cuddle up in a chair or a small corner. And so people don't realize that. So we do not have any breed or weight restrictions at Pegasus Residential. We do charge upfront pet fees and, and pet rent. It depends on the community. And we really focus on pet inclusivity featured prominently in our marketing. So we do a lot of pet adoption events when it comes to leasing and marketing. If we're trying to get some folks in the door and obviously right now, um, 
you know, with a lot of people working from home, they want to adopt pets. So we've done adoption events at our communities and our clubhouses, rent an apartment, we'll waive your adoption fee. So a lot of things that are coupled with that charitable, um, making sure that the homeless pets of the world do get do get a place to live because there's over, uh, over, I think over 4 million pets that are in shelters and, and there's a lot of euthanasia out there that we want to stop. So uh, we do screen all of our pets to mitigate those risks. We make sure that the, uh, you know, the owners that are coming in, that those pets, you know, pass through a screening process. And we also occasionally do some DNA work as well, which I know that uh, one of my colleagues is going to speak to a little bit more. What we found is that resident satisfaction and the sense of community experience is off the charts. Residents love each other. They they know each other by their dogs' names instead of their neighbors' names. That you know that's Spike's mom, or that's you know Max's mom, or or whatever, you know, Lucy's mom. So they know each other by pet names and they don't want to move because that sense of community of like, I don't want to leave my pet friends and they love my pet and they come into the office with their pet and we have yappy hours. We just do a lot to make sure that that inclusivity is there and that sense of community. So what we have found is that pet owners definitely renew more. I'm dear friends with Jamin and I don't know if I have an 80% uh, renewal rate on pet owners, but I certainly know that we have definitely seen at least a 25% increase in renewals with, uh, with pet owners. We also saw, as was evidenced early in one of the slides, an increase of about 25% pets during COVID because a lot of people were working for, from home and did want to go ahead and get a pet. So we definitely saw an increase, but we, we obviously welcomed that. So we're, we're proud to be part of the initiative of just saying, hey, let's, let's not look at the, the, the breed or the weight. Let's look at the pet and let's make sure that there's some accountability. So we, we definitely make sure of that. Um, and, and I think that when we set the tone up front, with our residents from the minute that they walk, well, actually from the minute that they place the first co- phone call with us that, hey, I'm interested in an apartment home and they mention they have a pet, we are welcoming them and their pet. We can't wait to meet you and Max. We can't wait to meet you and Lucy. So we're welcoming them in. But once that that tone is set that we're inclusive, we're also setting the tone that we're going to make sure that we they, that we have some accountability if there are any challenges. So we love pets at Pegasus Residential. And we want the whole industry to take on, you know, bringing pets into that kind of family atmosphere that we create so that we have residents that want to live with us long term and that they're very satisfied and they love living with Pegasus properties. So I'm going to turn it over back over to, to John. And and uh, if anybody has any questions about what we're doing at Pegasus, uh, you know, we're an open door here. We'd love to love to continue to converse. Thank you. The, the thing I love about Wendy and your story at Pegasus is, you know, you're sort of flipping the script. You're a poster child for saying, hey, we're welcoming to pets, but you're not having to abandon your principles. You're still setting expect- expectations. You're still creating accountability, but you're just well, you're more welcoming of all pets. And so there's a way to do this. And you guys are really leading the way. So thanks for that. So uh, David Oculus, right? So share, you know, give us uh, your perspective, what you're doing at your organization. We'd love to hear it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, John. Um, you know, as I indicated in my uh, intro, um, you know, my journey with pet ownership is, is relatively new. Unfortunately, I, I did not benefit from pet ownership growing up. And so uh, it was relatively new to me. But I think that in order to grow, you need to be aware of, of how the world reacts around you. And uh most of the companies that I have worked for and when I started Oculus, we allowed pets, but there I, I kind of followed a legacy thinking of, of pet restrictions and breed restrictions and weight restrictions, particularly being an urban operator until I started being schooled uh, in the experience. And so for those of you who are, are here today to kind of learn the tools to be able to take back to uh, whomever the decision makers are about your pet policies, you know, there, there's lots of ways to, to, to make the argument. Um, you know, first and foremost, I had a director of operations that worked for me for very many years who had a, a pit bull. And, uh, you know, so I kind of had bought into this whole pit bull is, you know, you know, a bee restriction, they're dangerous animals, all sorts of things. Well, this, this, this person's pit bull was the sweetest 
girl that I've ever met. And, and that was kind of my first introduction that it really had nothing to do with the breed, it really has everything to do with the responsibility of the pet owner. Um, and when I finally got my own dog about six years ago, whose name is Basil, who happens to be their chief happiness officer for our company, um, I did a lot of research as I do with everything on what it means to own a dog, what it means to have a dog in one's life. And that really kind of opened my eyes to, to, to the journey that led me to say in my company, the way that was built into to Wendy from, from their DNA, from your founder on, for me to say, this is the kind of company that I wanna be. I wanna be inclusive. I wanna be able to have all these uh, pets in my buildings. And then by the way, there's, there's a huge benefit. Uh, for me as an operator. Um, so when we eliminated breed and weight restrictions uh, several years ago, you know, we did the research. As John said, there was no insurance uh, requirement that we had uh, that required us. And we were insured with all the major carriers like Travelers and Hartford Mutual and, and Nationwide and a lot of the, the, the habitational carriers. Um, and we, we kind of set out to educate ourselves, which is why we made this decision. And then the minute we made this decision, it kind of opened our portfolio up to all sorts of community that we hadn't really built before because we weren't being pet centric. We allowed them, but it was like, ah, okay, you know, you can have them because we think we it, it's, it's good for business, but we're not exactly sure. But as an operations guy, I did want to make sure that accountability measures were, were in place. Um, and so we, we made sure that, um, that our residents were responsible for their animals. And of course, what we also discovered is that responsible pet owners really are responsible residents as well. And so the amount of, of problematic residencies from evictions to lease breaches and things like that declined tremendously when we started allowing just really a much larger pet community. But we have we do have very specific rules and regulations. Um, we do require that all of our pets are licensed and tagged. Um, we have lots of rules about sanitation and picking up after your animals. Um, we have lots of rules about behavior. And I say lots of rules, I, I, I hate to kind of couch it that way, but it's just, we make it very clear to people what the expectations are. And what we've discovered is that if you're a pet owner, you, you're already living that life. You're already a very responsible individual. So it benefits us. Um, one of the things that uh, John had mentioned is we're a big fan of uh, Who Prints, uh, which is a, a DNA uh, testing. Uh, a platform that we use um, to make sure that uh, every animal who comes in follows our, our policies and procedures. They all get swabbed for DNA. It's a cost that we bear um, to send it in. They get registered. And then that is kind of the carrot because they're registered, they get a tag. If, if the animal is lost, it can be looked up very quickly through the tag. And then the stick is you don't leave presents around the, uh, the property. Because if you do, we will take a sample of it and we will send it uh, back to Poo Prints and we'll find out exactly whose pet it was. And we, we charge a fee. And I have to say for all the years that we've been doing this, I think we've charged a fee twice. Um, I, so it, it works really, really well. And we've never had a, a, a resident and their pet ever say that that's problematic for them um, to go through that process. Again, if they're responsible pet owners, they understand the responsibility of being in a multifamily environment. Um, the, we do charge pet rents. Um, and we took a, we stopped taking security deposits as a company probably about a decade ago. Um, and again, everybody's submarkets a little different, but in the, the, the District of Columbia and, and surrounding areas, there's lots of rules and regulations about managing uh, deposits. So we chose not to do this. We be it became a very much a competitive advantage for us early on. Now many of our colleagues do this. But when we looked at the kind of concept of, of collecting move-in fees and any kind of damage that was come, we then applied that to our pet policies. So we no longer take pet deposits, we just take a move-in pet fee. Um, and then we charge a monthly fee that ranges anywhere from $25 to $50 uh, per pet per month, depending on the submarket that the property's in. And what we find is that it drives a tremendous amount of value to, uh, I'm sorry, I lost my, uh, 
AirPod here, um, drove a tremendous amount of value to our NOI. But in the rare instance where we have an extraordinary expense because of a defleeing or maybe cat urine or something like that, we can well afford to, to pay for that without having to go through the, uh, the bureaucracy and the logistics of, of maintaining pet deposits and things like that. And once again, we've never had anybody come back to us and say that that was a barrier to, uh, to entry. Um, and then let's talk about barriers to entry. Um, we have certainly benefited by not having breed restrictions or size restrictions. We, we are constantly told that in whatever submarket our property is in, that we're one of the very few communities that don't have the restrictions. And frankly, we rent to them. And that has been a boon for our business. And as Wendy said, uh, in her own experience, you know, pet owners are just fantastic residents. They create a tremendous amount of community. And my team has had such a fun time creating an environment uh, that not only welcomes the pets, but keeps pet owners and their pets very, very active from, as Wendy said, you know, the yappy hour. Um, we're about to do a program called Rough DMC um, as kind of a music festival and so many other things that, that, that we do. Um, we do, uh, we, we have decided to uh, outsource some of our programming um, and uh, we're very excited about that. And if anybody wants to learn about that, please contact me later. Um, that allows our, our staff to be less involved in the day-to-day -day of making all these things happen, but it becomes really valuable for us in how we present um, our experience, which then also includes not just the event, but we have a pet concierge who works with all of our pet owners on anything from, you know, minor ailments, you know, to vet uh, references to dog walking services or any other type of pet services. So we're really creating the, the way that you would do a concierge for your, your residents. We do this for our residents' pets as well, which creates this, this wonderful environment. Um, you know, we, we leverage social media, we, we leverage our platforms. Um, we have a resident uh, services platform like many companies have now, but we make sure that pet inclusivity is a huge part of that. We're doing uh, a, a program right now called Yes to the Address, uh, where we wanted to have our residents kind of tell us why they want to live in our buildings. And so far about 60% of all the responses have been pet related, which is absolutely amazing. You know, we thought it was just, you know, how great our team was and how beautiful our buildings are, but we find that it's uh, pets have a huge impact in that. Um, one of the things I do want to talk about that's not on the slide here is as a developer, um, we've also made it really important that all the buildings that we develop for ourselves or we advise on uh, that pet inclusivity is a big part of your amenities package. And I know that there's a lot of discussion now about, you know, music rooms and lots of other things, but you don't underestimate the value of your pet runs, your pet wash, you know, and all of the, uh, the entrance areas. Um, it, it makes an absolutely huge difference. And as an ur even as an urban uh, developer, we have found ways in the middle of the District of Columbia to put pet runs in alleys, to put pet runs on our rooftops, um, and do everything that it's absolutely possible. Spend the money, the capital, during the construction process, because it will pay tremendous amount of dividends uh, in creating your community and driving uh, uh, not only your lease ups, but then, of course, your retention, as, as Wendy talked about. Um, Again, uh, I don't have the stats that Jamie has, um, but I know that off the top of my head by finger in the wind that I know that our, our renewals and, uh, and resident experience as, as it's tracked through our resident surveys, um, you know, we get constant high ratings and renewals, a large part because of our, uh, our pet inclusivity. I think that's it, John. David, thank you. That was a, a wealth of knowledge. One thing that I really love is the, the, the point, and you said a lot of things I love, but one that really stood out to me is what you've done is you've created a competitive advantage in your community, in your market by yes. saying, hey, if other, if other operators around me won't take these particular pets or animals, we're willing to at least consider it. And that's making you stand out. And that's exactly what this is all about. And so, Judy, I can only imagine earlier, you talked a little bit about, you know, just this connecting communities and accountability. And after hearing from both Wendy and David, I mean, there's got to be some good nuggets you heard where you're thinking in your head, yes, yes, yes. 
Oh, absolutely. I mean, it is, you know, we can talk about the, the really measurable financial benefits of this. And obviously we talked about some of that data earlier, but the fact that the presence of more pets and, you know, pet amenities that cater to those pets creates more connected community. That's, I, you know, I think one of the biggest benefits of all, you know, we all know, we've seen the stats for years about how if we can create connections between our residents, we are creating longer term residents. You know, one of the concepts that the industry doesn't talk about a whole lot that, you know, having come from, from the supplier side and, and the sales side, we talk about a lot is, you know, total lifetime value of a customer. And so it really speaks to total lifetime value of a customer, right? You have customers who stay longer because they're happier, because their pets are accommodated. And, you know, like make no mistake, this is a huge competitive advantage right now for companies who have lifted restrictions. But yeah, love hearing about the greater connectedness of community. So, you know, I always, you know, when I attend these types of events, I'm always thinking, you know, what, what are the takeaways for the people who are listening or the ones that come back later and, and listen to the recording? And so this slide is really important, right? This, is, this is slide is talking about other ways to increase pet friendliness. And I, I sort of think of this slide in sort of three buckets. You know, there's the amenity side of it. Then there's the, the social aspect for the pets and the residents. And then there's just resources, the types of resources that, you know, like Oculus and um, Wendy, um, uh, Wendy's company are using. So uh, Pegasus. So why don't we first, and I'll go back and forth between Wendy and David. And uh, David, I'm going to start with you. And Wendy, you'll go next. Let's first talk about amenities. And I'm keeping an eye on time. So we'll probably give three minutes to each of these three buckets. So let's talk about amenities. What are some of the amenities that you think are like sort of must-haves and things you're doing there at Oculus? Yeah, well, as, as I indicated, uh, for us, the, the biggest amenity is, is a pet run. Uh, and a pet run doesn't even have to be huge. We, we, we have relatively small pet runs. But pet runs uh, not only are good for the health of your animals, but they're also the good for the health of your residents um, because it creates the environment of that community and being able to socialize with the pets, the pets get to know each other. You know, as Wendy said, you know, a lot of our residents know each other by the name of their pets. Um, and that happens a lot at the pet runs. Um, and, and we've had a lot of fun with that where we've named our pet runs usually after animals that are uh, our partners animals um, and things like that, which is, which is kind of fun. And then adjunct to the pet run is the pet wash. And, um, you know, pet washes can be as, as simple as, you know, a hose and, and something that is just available for a resident to be able to wash down their dog or do whatever. Or I was just in Miami two weeks ago and I saw a pet spa that was no less a pet spa. <laughs> in fact, I thought it was a human spa <laughs> when I first walked in the room. It was very, very impressive. And so, um, you know, it can, it can be, uh, you know, from one extent to the other, but I think having that availability shows again, the inclusivity that you're providing a resource for them. And by the way, and it's not just the pet wash, it's the grooming area. It's a place to, you know, put accoutrement, you know, and things like that. Um, obviously, having a pet waste areas is extremely important around the property. Again, it shows that um, you're being cognizant of the health requirements and it's a reminder to the responsibility of your pet owners to make sure that they're picking up after, after their dogs. Um, and then um, when we do our building, we're looking at common areas and making sure that they are uh, can withstand, you know, the the a, a, an animal, particularly dogs, you know, running through them. And so just take a look at your fit and finish and make sure that you're not doing something that can be scratched up with uh, with paws and things like that. So it's really kind of holistically looking at the property down to very specifically on the amenity. So Wendy, what are some of the things you guys are doing at Pegasus from a pet amenity standpoint? So I don't wanna be redundant. So a lot of the things that David has just mentioned, I'm just gonna let him go ahead and have that. But I think one of the most unique amenities that I ever came across was at a property that we managed in um, Texas and it was a pet beach. So it was actually a kind of a fenced in area that was also an area that they could run, but they actually had like a pool, a very shallow pool and it was a beach. So they just kind of could walk in to the water and it was quite large. It wasn't just like a, you know, as small as a baby pool. It was, it was probably, oh, I don't even know. I mean, it was, it was the size of like a regular size human pool, but it was rounded and it looked like kind of a, like a lake with kind of a beach access. That was really um, wonderful. Cool. 
I will also say that for like pet parks, I think it's really important that those amenities are attractive. People want to go and enjoy them. They've got some benches that you can sit, you plant some trees, maybe you've got some little flowers and pots so that, you know, they're up off the ground, but they're still adding some beauty to the area. They're kept extremely clean. All of those things are very important. And then potentially some pet resources. So not only to market to the uh, community that you have right there at, at, at the, at the, um, at the property, but also as a marketing tool for future residents, how amazing would it be to have a pet behaviorist or somebody that came and taught, you know, pet obedience at your properties on Saturday mornings and were able to come and actually help those pet owners become better pet parents. Because as anybody that's gone through obedience training knows, it is not about the dog. It's about the owner and teaching the owner how to train that pup. I mean, one of the most aha moments I ever had was when I had my Great Danes for the first time and I'm going through training and the, the canine trainer that helped us and he was a former you know, canine officer said, when you tell a dog, you know, uh, uh, hey, uh, Fido, sit, no, sit, 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 no, sit, sit. Which time are you talking about? Because the dog just heard sit about 11 times. So which one are they supposed to sit at? And they trained me to be like, Fido, sit, no, sit. And then if Fido didn't sit, then I helped Fido sit. And so there's a lot of things like that that I think can be resources that can also be marketing tools, can be a sense of community tools. I mean, there are so many things that we can do with what we already have that are free. Those behaviorists, those people that want to teach those classes, those, uh, you know, uh, landscaping designers, they can't wait to come be a part of the community because you know what they know? they're going to get more business from it later on because people are going to hire them. So I really think that this is all about the sense of community that we have and making sure that these folks, that so many of us, our fur babies are our children. Yes. That's what they are for Judy. That's what they have been for me. And I'm running across more and more people that that's their first child and sometimes their child that they have for the rest of their lives. But you've got this population of people that are in the apartment renter age. I don't even know if that's a thing anymore because it seems like we're just getting this, you know, huge variety of the 20 somethings up through the 50 somethings that are are renting that really do care about their pets. And as the 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 statistics at the beginning of this webinar with 67% of the population having pets and 46% of Gen Z and millennials, we'd be crazy not to allow them. Now, I I just think that we've got to become more inclusive and we've got to help the pet owners be good pet owners. And I will tell you some of the worst bites I've ever had by dogs have been by chihuahuas. So I'm I'm serious about that. So um, I know there's been a lot of questions in the chat that I'm sure that we're going to get to around some of these subjects. But what I can tell you is I think that if we're going to allow pets, whether you have breed restrictions or not, we have a duty to our residents to help them be great pet owners and to help uh, provide that sense of community to some of these things that we're talking about here on this screen and throughout the talk here. So I can't wait to get some of the questions. Yeah, we're going to get to those. And thank you. And I will say that Jay Turner research that uh, uh, survey we did, pet screening and Jay Turner, we asked about amenities. And the number one thing was shade, shade and pet. Yes. They yes. just put up yes. some shade because they're standing there. Um, and 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 I know, David, you're a developer, so you can a lot of times pre-plan building these things, but some operators go into communities that they have to retrofit. And so they're looking for the cheapest way to provide the biggest bang for the buck. And putting in a dog park, a fenced area, and some shade is typically high on that list because it's doable. So um, uh, another thing, uh, uh, John, Wendy, share, yes. John, before, before you go on, I want to make a comment on two things Wendy said. Um, uh, in regards to kind of the pet uh, training, um, we have had extremely good luck with our local pet superstores yes. um, that are in our submarkets where they will come in at no cost um, and do uh, do training for us and for our residents. Of course, it's great business for them because they are getting new customers. Um, and so don't be shy, you know, reach out to uh, a, a PetSmart or whoever it might be to get them to come to your, your, your property. Uh, and the other thing you said is that you mentioned your landscapers. And again, as a developer, I also wanted to make very clear that a, a good pet run is not standard turf um, that really kind of turns into mud. 
um, pretty quickly is that work with your landscaper because there are tremendous amounts of dog run turf products out there that do require maintenance, but keep your dog run extremely hygienic um, and, and whatnot. So I just wanted to make sure everybody understood that that's the, a best practice in creating your dog runs. And I want to mention one more thing about it event because I know that as I've traveled, I've seen hotels that have done this where they have a pet in the lobby that is adoptable. And we have also done that as an on-site event where we'll have a litter of kittens or we'll have some puppies or some um, dogs from a local shelter that actually will you know, live with us for a week or two until they get adopted. And we rent an apartment with that pup or one of our residents comes and adopts that pup or those kittens. And let me tell you what, who doesn't wanna stop into a leasing office full of little kittens or puppies? Everybody does. Incredible. So it's really kind of a showstopper. And at the same time, you get a lot of movement on those animals getting great homes. Yeah, no doubt. You know, I, I, we talked to me about being in the House of Representatives. When I campaign, I have two secret weapons, my wife and my dog. That's uh, right. Every, everyone wants to talk to both. So, uh, and I'm better for it, for sure. Uh, so we so we covered a lot in that little uh, section there, but resources for the industry, just curious before we go to Q&A, you know, we talked a little bit about some, um, uh, we've heard a little bit about poop prints. Are there any other in resources in the industry you guys you know, want to talk about before we go to Q&A? I um, mentioned well, some in the chats, but I mean, I know okay. there's a number of different brands. And of course, NAA has an entire, um, you know, our website is full of, of, of current vendor partners, exactly. uh, excuse me, supplier partners that we have with the National Apartment Association that are members that we love to do business with, such as, you know, Doggy DNA and Poop Prints and, and, um, and, and things like that. So there's a lot of great resources for people out there. Yeah, one additional resource I would mention because I've seen a lot of chatter in the um, in the chat and the Q and A about you know how do we convince owners? Definitely go take a look at the Jay Turner report. Um, you know I, I'm sure uh, if you reach out to John, he can share some information on that with you, or go to the FoundAnimals.org website and take a look at the um, Pet Inclusive Housing report because there's a great deal of data that may help sway owners on that. So, so Judy, we, I want to get to Q&A, but I do want to help you, maybe have you kind of round this out before we go to Q&A. We've talked a lot about, you know, the past with pets, the present, but where do you think the future is with just pets in the rental housing industry in, in general? Yeah, it's a great question and I'll be brief, but first I have to say, Wendy, amen, sister, my three little gorgeous Shiba Inus are my babies, has, have, as has been every dog or cat I've ever had. Um, and if I'm a renter, I don't care how amazing that rental unit is, I'm not giving up my pet to live there. So something to think about. And in terms of the future, I think we're going to see what we've always seen in multifamily, which is that the market is going to drive that, right? Yes. We are approaching 70% of U.S. households um, have a pet, um, dogs, have a slight edge over cats, but you know, in terms of population, they're pretty even. Um, not only are we a $1.3 billion pet market, we're the largest pet market in the world. We love to spend money on our pets and we love to take care of our pets and make them happy. So again, the market's gonna drive that. We got an indication of that with the pandemic when we saw so many more adoptions and shelter census um, uh, rates driving way down because there were not as many pets being um, surrendered. And I believe the number two reason for pets being surrendered is that they have difficulty finding housing or they are their fear getting kicked out of their housing. So again, the market's gonna drive it. You know, the bottom line is we love our pets and it's just a matter of, do you want to garner that competitive advantage now or later? Thank you for that. So we have lots of chats going on, lots of questions. So I'm gonna do my best to play traffic cop on some of these. So if I jump around, I'm not gonna go in order because some of these are very similar. Um, We'll let James help answer uh, about getting a copy of this deck and is it recorded? James? Oh, well, again, thanks. Thank you, John and Wendy and Judy and David. This has really been fantastic information. In terms of a copy of the slideshow, uh, NAA typically doesn't do that. What we do is we have a copy of the recording posted to our website and also to our YouTube channel. Uh, if you want the deck itself, uh, our next slide after Q&A, there'll be some email addresses. You're welcome to email any individual on that list for whatever they care to share. 
Okay, thank you for that. So that a couple of questions uh, asked the same. So uh, one of the questions from my good friend Susan just up the road here in North Carolina is how do we handle general liability applications that still ask about breed restrictions? Uh, Judy, I mean, you know, I know I have some thoughts on that, but I'll let you jump in on that question. Um, actually, John, I'm going to bounce that to you because I oh, think sure. you're going to have a better answer for that than I will. Yeah, so I, I will just tell you that there are insurance companies, general liability uh products that still have breed restrictions, but there are also GL policies out there that do not. So I would flip the script and I would just find Absolutely. out with your insurance provider before you renew, hey, can you can you let me know if I have breed restrictions on my policy? Start there. You may be surprised what you learn. You may be surprised that you don't have them and you just thought you did. If they say right. yes, and it's in writing and it is in the policy, Give yourself enough runway to go shop the competition. I mean, they're competing for business just like we are, uh, all friends. of us. And I think that's a great way to handle that. So, exactly. uh, you know, Susan, we're friends. So you obviously can reach out to me and I'll share more of what I know. Uh, I'm going to go on here. Just a couple things. Uh, let's look at. Oh, what kind of this is from Jeff Graham. Hey, Jeff, thanks for joining. What kinds of questions should we be asking pet owners when we're interviewing pet owners when we do meet and greets with the pets? I don't know if, if Wendy or David have any words of wisdom there. Well, I, I, I'm not, I don't generally, um, Eat the pet I, yeah, I don't, I mean, I, unfortunately I'm not on site on a daily basis. However, as I've mentioned in some of the chats, we use a pet screening tool that will help us, um, determine, you know, whether the pet's going to be a good fit for us. And then I also think that our, our managers on site, they do want to meet some of the animals before they come in. So they will arrange, Hey, you know, I know you're coming for a tour, but when you're going to come sign your lease before you move in, what, you know, or hey, want to come back for a second tour because they want to meet that animal, especially if they have any kind of concerns. But I think to make sure that you've got a consistent way of screening, uh, we want to make sure that every single pet is treated fairly and every single pet owner is treated fairly. So that's why we utilize a pet screening product. Um, but I think that meet and greets are great. I think that there's been some concern about, you know, uh, dogs that are, 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 are misbehaved or breeds that people are afraid of. I will tell you that dogs and animals can sense people that are nervous about them. And so that is the number one thing is to get yourself comfortable and maybe uh, desensitized. And, and then also to make sure that you're doing meet and greets that, that the dog wants to have. Because I know that whenever I've done meet and greets between animals, and I do a lot of rescue work, I volunteer here for the Great Dane Rescue here in South Carolina. I do a ton of virtual visits all the time. We do meet and greets and adoption days very frequently. I'm not as involved with those at the physical level. But in order to get two dogs to meet, what we do is we walk the dogs. The dogs get a walk and we are separate and they go down the road. And when that dog start to tire out, we start to bring those dogs closer and closer together so that they're tired. And you introduce them in a very, very specific manner. The same thing has to be said of when you introduce dogs to people, when you introduce dogs to dogs, is you don't put them just face to face. Heck, I don't want to necessarily want to meet a person face to face sometimes, that, you know, but you, just have, you have to, you, it has to be, you have to ease into it. So I think those things are very important. You know, Wendy, I'll tell you at Pet Screening, we ask 21 questions of every single pet owner. There you go. You'd be surprised. And, and we make them legally attest on the record, which is, can be used in a court of law. And you'd be amazed the information you get out of someone when you just flat out ask them a question such as, do you keep your dog on a leash at all times unless your dog is in an enclosed fenced area? And you would first think, well, who's going to say no to that? You'd be surprised how many people say no because they think their dog is the best trained dog in the world and it would never leave their side. But it's the squirrel or the chihuahua across the street that, that the dog thinks it's a squirrel that you can never predict. And most dog bites happen off leash. So uh, this is a great example. Uh, David, I'm gonna throw you a question here one second. Uh, let's see, here's one. Can we restrict pets in the pool unless it's a service dog for the blind? Yeah, obviously service dogs are welcome in pool areas, but you can set your own pet policies. And if you don't allow household pets in a pool area, then that's fair game. They're not, pets are not a protected class. You can say no pets in the pool area, but if it is a, a type of assistance animal, then you would need to allow them. Uh, DNA, you talked a little bit about DNA, your properties, David. So someone's asking, what is the purpose of doing DA, DNA on your animal? Is it another option than chipping your pet? It's, it's, it's definitely not microchipping. Microchipping, I encourage you to get all your, uh, make sure uh, if you have a pet, please make sure it's microchipped. I know Judy would echo that sentiment. Yes. But why are you using the DNA uh, poo prints? What does that really yeah, mean? Yeah, the, the specific, well, there, so it's two, it's two things. So one, uh, by using poo prints in the DNA, it creates a registry. Um, that uh, your your resident's dog gets a tag with a specific code on it. And should you be separated from your dog, somebody can actually go to the website or make the phone call and um, uh, 
find out which dog it is because of the registration of the DNA. But the primary purpose and why it's called poop prints is if uh, an animal has left waste in an area where it's not supposed to be, we can actually send a sample and, and poop prints sends you an entire kit uh, with gloves um, to do a small sample and you send that off and they will find the registration of which animal it is. And then you can work with your resident on reminding them what the responsibility is. So it's basically, it's primarily to identify the animal through its waste and the DNA is found in the waste. Thank, thank you for that. And Sandra, she asked about noise, barking, anxiety in animals. How do you handle that when owners leave them along? Um, yeah, know. that's that's actually a, a great question. So it goes back to uh, setting expectations um, right off the bat. Uh, and making sure that it's not only in kind of your orientation when you've done your pet screening, but it's also in your paperwork. Um, and that in the end of the day, a, an animal that's left too long or is consistently barking is no different than somebody who's playing their music at three o'clock in the morning. It's a, right. lease, it's, a, it's, a, it's a breach of lease. And so you deal with it the same exact way you would deal with any other kind of breach of lease. Yeah, there's and that's also in the chat from Robin, and it's really your your general lease, your NAA lease will cover yes. all these behaviors. It won't necessarily specifically talk about barking, but it's going to cover any violations of your lease, and you're going to be able to use that to cover those instances of barking or nuisance. But you know, that's that's a great opportunity right there. Listen, your dog's got some separation anxiety issues. You know, it's having a it's having a challenge. Let's let's get you set up with a trainer. Maybe you give that as a renewal gift, or you give that as a little gift to that resident and trying to help them. And yeah. there's ways that we can create a sense of community that way. I do want to pile on and just say here, if um, because we get this question a lot of pet screening, if there's a dog on site that is just you know nipping at people, uh, but it's a service animal, they feel you know operators feel trapped, and you're not you're under not. the fair house under the fair house yeah. the fair housing act guidance for under HUD as it relates to assistance animals, they must follow the same pet policy rules. So if you have someone that is you know a, a pet or even an owner, it's really the owner's fault for letting that pet do that. But together, right, they one and the same here. As long as you have it well documented and you've requested that they better control their their animal, and you've done that and you document it, right? Just, you need to document. That's very key. Or you like everything. That's right. But once you have that record, you can actually use that as grounds to have them remove their assistance animal. It's you know I'm not saying it's easy, but it can be done. So you are not trapped. Uh, there's some work there that goes along, but you do have some options. Uh, David is asking uh, a question about, um, uh, I think it was like, uh, if you have a pet and then they try to say it's a service animal, you know, do we have to deal with that? Yeah, there's just, you know, the Fair Housing Act does not put a timeline on when someone needs to disclose their disability. They still have an uh, obligation to make an accommodation request. They just can't do it without your permission. They have to make the request. But you can very well have someone live there for three or four months and have some sort of traumatic event. Think of a terrible car accident they were in and they witnessed something very egregious. If someone got run over by a car, I've heard of that type of situation, and they have nightmares and they need an, uh, an assistance animal for anxiety. They may not have had that when they moved in, but now they do. So timing doesn't really come into play. It's always fair game. You just have to make sure you go through the process to make sure it meets the standard. And, and, and obviously, you know, we can help you do that. Um, Judy, here's some questions about class. Class A properties in terms of all these programs and amenities seem to be for higher end properties. What, have you heard anything on how you know B and C level properties are doing with amenities, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think obviously, obviously the A class properties um, usually have a little bit more in terms of funds to devote to different types of amenities. But we're seeing, you know, um, dog runs in particular, bark parks at a lot of different types of apartment community classes. So, you know, they're out there and, in, um, you know, often I think what we are seeing is that communities are repurposing and uh, little used amenity um, toward that. Um, I also wanted to throw in here, John, um, you had spoken about microchipping earlier. I would really encourage everybody to go, if you if you know someone whose animal is not microchipped or you need to get yours microchipped, go to the foundanimals.org site for some information on free microchipping there. And then um, back to the discussion about, um, you know, what do you do if um, you do have an issue with an animal on site? 
I really want to emphasize that, um, you know, creating those upfront expectations is so important, you know, human nature, right? If we know what the rules are, and importantly, if we know what the consequences are, we're really likely to avoid that behavior. And I think that's really true with pet owners as well. So it's so important to create those expectations, have a really good set of policies, and, you know, um, put, make sure that you do in within those policies, help people understand what the consequences of a violation um, may be. Very good. So we are at the top of the hour, it's 2.59 and there, there, are, there are a handful more questions, but I, um, you know, we will make ourselves available. Uh, James, I'll kick it over to you and then I'll close it out at the very end. Oh, terrific, John. And again, thank you so much to yourself and our, our three outstanding panelists. This has been extremely informative and I think great for our audience as well. If you need to follow up with any of the individual panelists, there are their emails. You can also probably reach out to them on LinkedIn as well. Very accommodating, very accessible. Now, I want to let the audience know that uh, it ain't me. NAA maintains an online portal for its many offerings and operation solutions for rental housing, not just pet technology, but others. And the URL is featured below. And I especially want to highlight what we've just put on with mental health. You see it highlighted there. Uh, we're going to have a NAA's Mental Health Awareness Week. We've partnered with the National Council for Mental Wellbeing to present a series of four webinars addressing mental health issues felt keenly within the rental housing industry. Topics include handling stress for maintenance teams, responding to trauma, mitigating employee burnout, and coping strategies for on-site staff. These four webinars will be hosted during the week of May 2nd. They are free to join, so make sure to register today. And in addition, we've, uh, if you enjoyed today's webinar and would like to view more, you can always visit our YouTube channel for those many NAA webinars that are now viewable on demand. The URL is featured below. Again, I wish to thank everyone for participating. Thank you to John, Wendy, Judy, and David. And thank you to our audience. We value your membership and appreciate your attendance. Have a great afternoon. And James, if I may, go back to our slide with the emails. For everybody, I want you to see everybody's pooches. Uh, this great. is awesome, <laughs> yes. So here's everyone's email. My dog's Maggie. Uh, tell us your quick, quick names of your pooches here, Wendy. Uh, that's Lola. And that was the day that we pulled her out of a veterinarian office where she'd been awesome. left behind. Awesome. She's been with us ever since. How about that's you, awesome. Judy? Uh, so from left to right, we've got Sadie, Coda, and Emma. Awesome. And David? This is Basil. Awesome. Well, hey, I've had a lot of fun. Thank you. You have our emails right here. Reach out to us. As you can see, there's no strangers on this call. Absolutely. James, NAA, thank you for uh, hosting this. this thank you, everybody. Yes. Thank, thank you so everybody. much. Thank you, everyone. James, thank you as always, you're amazing. Uh, James, oh, thank you. Thank you guys, terrific. So I'm gonna end it, but again, appreciate all your efforts. This is a great webinar for all of Have us. Have a great afternoon. Bye, Judy, love you. Bye, love you, babe. <laughs>